Would you pray with me? Awaken us, God, with your truth and your love for the world and everything in it. Open our minds and our hearts for the word you have for us today. And give us faith to trust you with our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here are some of the things that come to my mind. The loss of a job, a divorce, the passing of a beloved pet, not getting the job we wanted, or getting the job we wanted, but it turned out not to be all it cracked up to be. Retirement, whether forced or unforced, a debilitating illness, the passing of someone we love, moving to a new community, not being accepted into the college we hoped that we would be, finding out that our partner is having an affair, regrets that we have su such wishing we had gone a different direction than we did when we came to a fork in the road, seeing our parents' health decline, alienation from family members, these are just some of the things that I think of. What do all of these things have in common, do you think? You can probably guess from the title of the sermon. You may think that I got it from Charlie Brown's favorite two words, good grief. I actually got the title of the sermon from a little book by a professor of medicine and religion, Granger Westberg. The title of the book is Good Grief. Although it is not set in stone, he speaks of there being 10 stages of grief. Others have a disagreement about that or have fewer or more stages. The stages are this by him though. We often have shock. It's at this stage that we may be in such shock that we are in denial that something has happened. We're not lying to ourselves. That's why it's okay and normal to be at this stage of, um, of grief as long as we don't get stuck there. To be in shock is a coping mechanism by our body which happens because we simply can't handle the enormity of the grief. Second stage is we may express emotions. We may feel any number of emotions and hopefully we do begin to express them. Among other things, we may cry, which is perfectly normal and can be healing. Third, we may feel depressed and lonely. Granger Westberg says that depression can be described as being like a cloudy day when the sun is completely blocked out. We say that the sun isn't shining today the sun is actually shining, though, behind the clouds, but we can't see it. And at this stage, we may feel that we are the only person who has grieved like we are, so we feel utterly alone. We may feel that God has even withdrawn from us, or we may feel that there is no God at all. One of the psalmists cries out, Why are you cast down, my soul? My soul is cast down within me. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Fourth, we may have physical symptoms of distress. Intense grief makes us more vulnerable to becoming physically ill. It's common for a person to experience physical illness in the midst of intense grief or shortly after. Fifth, we may become panicky. This may happen because we find that we aren't functioning as well as we have in the past. We think that something is wrong with us. So we become pan panicky when actually what is happening is that we're experiencing grief. Sixth, we may feel a sense of guilt about the loss. We may think if I had only done more or done things differently, then this thing would not have happened. So we feel guilty for not doing things, or maybe we feel guilty for doing things a certain way. 
At this stage, no matter how much others try to encourage us, we can't seem to extricate ourselves from it. Seventh, we may be filled with anger and resentment. Some of us have been taught that anger is wrong. But if we don't express anger in appropriate ways, it can only deepen depression. You probably heard it said that depression is simply anger turned inward. Eight, we may resist turning to a, quote, normal state. We may find that when we attempt to get back into life again, it is much too painful. We find that grieving is painful also, but not as painful as facing entirely new situations. We are more comfortable with our grief than we are in the unpredictable world. Nine, we begin to feel hope. The Apostle Paul has written, we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. As we grieve, as we go through these stages, hope will come back. Note that I said as we work through the stages, grief is hard work. But if we will do the things that the stages call us to do, hope will return. And although Anne Lamott words that we have heard today about the passing of a loved one, she speaks primarily about that, her words can be applied to all kinds of grief and the words have hope in them. I adapt what she has written. You will lose someone or something you can't live without. And your heart will be badly broken and the bad news as you never completely get over the loss. But this is also the good news. They or it live forever in our broken heart that doesn't seal back up. And you come through. It's like having a broken leg, she says, that never heals perfectly, that still hurts when the weather gets cold, but you learn to dance with the lamp. Her words remind us that there is hope because she says that we learn to go on, to push on with our lives. What gives us hope? Among other things, other people give us hope. Sometimes the last thing we need to hear are some of the things that people say to us when we experience loss. At the same time, we are made for relationship. As I've heard it said in Genesis 1, it could be said in the beginning there was relationship. A community of faith can play a vital role in helping us when we are grieving. In both of our brief passages today, the Apostle Paul reminds us of this. In Romans, he says that we are to be happy with those who are happy and we are to cry with those who are crying. He gives a beautiful description, doesn't he, of what a church is to be like. And the reading from 1 Thessalonians does also continue encouraging each other and building each other up just like you're doing already. The context of these words from 1 Thessalonians is the discouragement that those in the church were feeling since Jesus had not returned. People continued to die and the church believed that Jesus would return before this happened. And in the letter, Paul in essence says this, don't concern yourselves with this, instead focus on doing ministry and encouraging each other. We may not be able to relate to the idea of Jesus returning. It's the 21st century. We're modern people. But we can relate to Paul's words that we are to encourage each other and build each other up, particularly when we are grieving or someone else in the church is grieving over any number of things. And then the last stage is this. When we are at it, this time of grieving, we struggle to affirm reality As we begin to struggle to affirm reality, we find that we need not be afraid of the real world. We can live in it again. We can even love it again. For a time, we may have thought that there was nothing about it that we could affirm. 
Now the dark clouds are beginning to break up and occasionally for brief moments rays of sun come through and hope once more becomes part of our outlook on life. Though we continue to struggle, we do affirm reality. When we get to this point, we have been grieving in ways that can bring healing. We have been and continue to practice good grief. Those are the 10 stages that Granger Westberg says that grief consists of. But to use the words, the word stages seems to imply that we go through the list I have just mentioned one by one and we can't move on to the next stage until we work through the previous stage. This isn't the way that grief is. For example, we may feel the fifth stage of being panicky before we feel the fourth stage of physical illness. And we may bounce around from stage to stage. Also, we may feel two or more stages simultaneously. Now, there are those who say some ridiculous things to us at times of grief. They may say, if you simply have enough faith, you won't grieve deeply or at all. I have to ask, what does a person have in mind when they say, if we have enough faith, how do they measure enough? And for those who speak of faith this way, I have to wonder if they have read or heard the Bible in general or the stories of Jesus in particular. I think of Jesus and the words from the King James Version, the shortest verse of the Bible, two words, Jesus wept. It seems that he cried for two reasons. First, his dear friend Lazarus had died. And second, Jesus wept because Jesus' family and friends were openly crying. Jesus hurt with them. And then there is the example of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane crying out to God as he could sense that he was going to be seized by the powers that be and put to death. And then I think of Jesus' words on the cross according to Matthew he cried out with words of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can feel the words of deep grief that Jesus spoke. His grief seems to come from the belief that at that moment God was nowhere to be found. Even Jesus believed that. In a strange sense, it's reassuring to know that Jesus grieved. If he did, Surely none of us is exempt from experiencing it. Losses are inevitable in life and there is no one right way to deal with them. But generally speaking, if we work through the stages of grief that I have mentioned, then we can begin to move on with our lives, not unscathed, yet we can put one step in front of the other. Let us help each other do this.